The next item of business is a statement by Angela Constance on accountability for delivering the national mission to reduce drug deaths and improve lives. The Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Angela Constance, Minister, uh, around, uh, up to 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. The loss of life in Scotland from drug-related deaths is as heartbreaking as it is unacceptable. Every drug death is a tragedy, leaving families, friends and loved ones looking for answers and support. And I offer my condolences to everyone who has been affected by a drug death, and I reaffirm my commitment to work across government, parliament and beyond to deliver the national mission to save and improve lives. The impact of problematic drug use is far-reaching and can cause harm in every aspect of life. That is why our national mission needs to be far-reaching through an all-government, all-Scotland approach with shared accountability at each and every level. People with drug problems often experience complex needs and require support from more than one service. Consequently, lines of accountability can be complex. Over the lifetime of this Parliament, we will ensure effective accountability is in place through the establishment of the National Care Service, which will have responsibility for alcohol and drug services. It will provide a single structure for accountability, better oversight of delivery, and the further integration of community health and social care will provide better joined-up and person-centred services. But we cannot wait until the full establishment of the National Care Service, and that is why we are taking action now to improve accountability at all levels. The national mission is backed by an additional investment of £50 million per annum. This is a 67 per cent increase since 2014-15, and we are now investing over £140 million in drug and alcohol services. Of this additional £50 million, over £20 million is invested through integration authorities for health and social care, plus an additional £10 million to support the implementation of MAT standards. Transparency and reporting remain key to the success of the national mission, and that is why I am asking integration authorities to account for these funds more thoroughly by increasing the frequency of their reporting from annually to quarterly. In May 2021, we opened four new funds to invest in recovery, local support, children and families and other service improvements. And we have committed up to £18 million a year on a multi-year basis, which provides security for third sector grassroots and advocacy organisations, which are often at the forefront of saving lives. And this approach enables me to account for this investment and ensure that it is made in ways that will deliver the national mission. While accountability to government and parliament is essential, I have also been working with COSLA to support local areas to improve the accountability within alcohol and drug partnerships. We have agreed eight recommendations with COSLA to improve strategic planning and are testing new tools to enable local areas to review and improve accountability with appropriate external validation. And let me be clear, local lived experience panels are also core and central to the planning and development of local services. We are also working with Public Health Scotland to improve the use of local evidence through data sets such as DAISY. We are also developing a local performance framework which will set out clear expectations across the national mission and will provide transparency and enable us to measure progress at a local level. Earlier this year, I announced phase one of the new treatment target to ensure more people with problematic opiate use are accessing life-saving community treatment, and Public Health Scotland will publish quarterly data on progress. To ensure that people receive the protection of treatment or recovery that is right for them, we set integration authorities the ambitious target of embedding the medication-assisted treatment targets by April this year. Local progress from each health and social care partnership is being evaluated by the MAT support team and a report will be published in June to coincide with my update to Parliament. And the report will be a collation of operational procedures, data and, crucially, lived experience evaluation undertaken by peer researchers. In November last year, I set out my expectations to increase the number of people accessing residential rehab 
I have responded to calls for more transparency and accountability by working with Public Health Scotland to track the number of placements. This gives me a clear line of sight on how the residential rehab money is being spent. And I am committed to increase the number of publicly funded placements by more than 300 per cent, so that by 2026, at least 1,000 people every year are publicly funded for their rehab placement. Alongside this, we have published good practice on the pathways needed to ensure people are prepared for rehab and receive the support they need after the treatment and rehab is complete. As a result, my expectations could not be clearer. In the first nine months of the last financial year, ADPs funded 326 placements with an investment of around £2.2 million from the £5 million allocated to them to fund both placements and aftercare. I am heartened by this progress, but I expect these numbers to continuously improve as we actively work with areas where the data shows both to ourselves and government, but also to local populations that access is most challenging. Our priority must always be to prevent the tragedy of drug deaths, and each and every death is one too many that devastates families and communities. I am determined that we learn every lesson from every death so that services are improved to better meet the needs of our citizens who are at risk of dying. When a child or vulnerable adult dies, Chief Officers for Public Protection play a key role in ensuring that we learn vital lessons from these tragic events. And I intend to do what is necessary so that the same Chief Officers take on a new accountability to ensure that lessons are learnt and changes made from the reviews of all drug-related deaths. Therefore, I will be setting out clear expectations to ensure consistency in how these reviews are carried out, as well as issuing guidance and training for all those involved. The Drugs Death Task Force have a strong interest in this area of work and may make further recommendations in their forthcoming report this summer. We already publish quarterly suspected drug deaths management information from Police Scotland, in addition to the annual national statistics report from National Records Scotland. And we are investing a further £592,000 to improve the national drug-related death database. And the leadership provided by directors of public health will enable us to use this unparalleled amount of information to best effect to deliver meaningful change. I have also taken action to improve the accountability of the national mission at a Scotland level. I have provided a renewed focus for the National Mission Implementation Group to provide scrutiny, challenge and advice to the Scottish Government and the wider sector. This includes advice from international experts. The second year of the National Mission is focused on delivery on the ground where it matters most, and I need this group to provide robust scrutiny and advice to ensure we are delivering for those that need it most. I will also be publishing a National Mission Plan in the summer, which sets out plans for implementing the mission over the course of the remaining four years. The plan will include an outcomes framework which will enable us to better monitor the impact we are having on prevention and early intervention, the reorientation of a system of care that is treatment, recovery and trauma informed, as well as supporting families and communities. Professor Alan Miller, as Chair of the National Collaborative for People with Lived and Living Experience, will bring forward the vision for integrating human rights into national policy at a local and national level, both at service design and on delivery. The Collaborative will contribute to developing monitoring and accountability mechanisms based on the internationally recognised human rights to be included in the forthcoming Human Rights Bill. Human Rights and the National Collaborative provide a way of holding the government, both locally and nationally, to account, of making sure that people who use drugs can participate in decision-making which affects them, of exposing stigma and discrimination, and of asking tough questions and demanding clear answers. Presiding officer, more than ever before, we are reforming services, providing practical as well as financial support, gathering and publishing more information so that we can challenge ourselves and each other at all levels to foster responsibility for and accountability to people with drug and alcohol difficulties who, like you or I, are entitled to services that meet their needs. This is a key part of getting it right for everyone. Thank you.
Thank you, Minister. Uh, the Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement, and I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if those members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak buttons now, and I call on Sue Webber. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I would like to thank the Minister for advance sight of the statement. And we welcome this statement, which provides some clarity on the Scottish Government's approach to tackling this national shame. With 1,339 drug-related deaths in Scotland in 2020, it is clear that the national mission sent by the Government desperately needs to succeed. First, I am glad there is more detail on spending and accountability, and I thank the Minister for looking at how accountability can be improved at all levels. Accountability is key to making real progress real progress on the ground, but further clarification is needed on who is ultimately responsible for ensuring the consistent implementation of the MAT standards. We have got the First Minister, we have the Drugs Minister, the Drugs Death Task Force, Alcohol and Drug, Drug Partnerships and now the National Mission Implementation Group. So I have one straightforward question. Who is ultimately accountable for delivering the national mission? and how are all these groups working together to tackle our national shame. More specifically, time and time again, I speak to people who have been on methadone for over two decades. They are desperate to come off methadone and onto a more modern and safe opiate replacement. And MAT Standard 2 states that all people should be supported to make an informed choice on what medication to use for MAT and the appropriate dose. I know I have asked before, Minister, but what can the Scottish Government do to accelerate and facilitate their movement to safer replacement therapies like Bouvidol? Minister. Thank you very much, President Officer, and I uh, appreciate those comments from Ms Webber. Um, improving clarity and providing more detail about the accountability and the investments that we are um, implementing to provide change on the ground is of crucial importance. Um, of course, the whole res d'etre of the statement today was to demonstrate how across the piece that we are improving accountability, both at a national uh, and a local level. Can I say the purpose of the uh, National Mission Implementation Group is to give oversight uh, and advice uh, as opposed to responsibility. Responsibility uh, will always, of course, rest uh, with this government, um, including myself. But it is important to stress also that integration authorities have a, a legal responsibility to plan and deliver uh, treatment and recovery services. But I think we all have to recognise that they can't do this alone, that they must work with others. Uh, they must provide you know, adequate support to alcohol and drug partnerships. And of course, alcohol and drug partnerships uh, must be uh, engaging and working with the lived and living experience community and uh, voluntary organisations. So, you know, ultimately, I would never for a minute demur from my responsibilities or the responsibilities um, of this government. But accountability is shared. We are accountable to ourselves and to each other, and we all have a responsibility to hold ourselves and each other to account. In terms of the final point that Ms Webber makes, um, it is important to recognise that methadone uh, is a treatment, an internationally recognised treatment. It should not be stigmatised. Uh, it should not ever be our only offer. Uh, to anyone. People, by and large, need a holistic uh, range of care and treatments. And Bouvidol has, of course, shown much success. It was first um, implemented in Scotland um, after actually looking at the trailblazing work in, in Wales uh, during the pandemic um, in, our, in our prison. Again, Bouvidol does not suit everyone. Um, but it offers uh, huge opportunities actually to release people to get on with their daily life and release them um, from a, a daily, daily trip to the chemist. Thank you. I call Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement. We agree that accountability is crucial and the Government must face scrutiny over their progress on tackling Scotland's appalling record on drug fatalities. The Minister is on record as stating that the MAT standards would be implemented, not just embedded, but implemented in a year. It gives me no satisfaction to say that this commitment is heading for failure. 
So will the Minister, rather than provide generalised statements, commit to publishing progress standard by standard, ADP by ADP, to allow for proper scrutiny and accountability? And the Minister's statement stresses the importance of transparency. Will the Minister ensure that a full and detailed breakdown of spending on drug and alcohol services will be published in one place and made easily accessible, as recommended by Audit Scotland, who describe current information as incomplete, disparate and inconsistent? And finally, Audit Scotland recommend that the national drug and alcohol target waiting time of 28 days is too long. Will the Minister commit to action to amend this? Minister. Thank you very much, President Officer, and I am grateful to Ms. Baker. The medication assisted treatment standards are a significant undertaking. Uh, they are not a tick box exercise, um, and that is why I did indeed commit to embed or implement uh, by April this year, but that will have to be followed up by improving the standards uh, and also sustaining the standards. Um, this is not um, a tick box exercise. I want to see far more evidence uh, collected other than people showing me their operational procedures. And that is why um, we are evaluating local progress from each health and social care partnership. Um, that progress is being evaluated. And yes, of course, it is looking at their operational standards uh, and their policy and procedures, but crucially, it is also looking at data. And I think the, the third strand um, of um, our accountability and evaluation of progress at a local level um, is the work that is currently being done uh, with the, the, the peer researchers, because this always has to be testing um, how services are delivered and received by those who need them and by those uh, who these services are, are, are meant to serve. Um, and I am um, conscious, presiding officer, of time and that I have in detail answered um, written parliamentary questions. Um, outlining that I will indeed, uh, as per my commitment to six monthly reporting, be back in my, on my feet in this chamber in June um, with a report uh, that will look at the national picture, but it will also cover um, area by area. Um, we will be able to report on the progress um, of each um, standard, um, but that will also be followed up by um, a more in-depth report in the summer, which is not just looking at whether um, a standard has been met or not, area by area, but it is looking at the, the criteria for meeting each of those standards, area by area. So I want to reassure Ms Baker that there is a substantial amount of work going on right now to gather up-to-date evidence on the progress that is being made, but also the further work uh, that we will have to um, pursue over the, the lifetime of the national mission. And uh, the point about Audit Scotland and publishing spending in one place, um, I agree with. Uh, and the whole purpose of moving uh, to match standards is in a recognition that waiting time treatment targets is not the best measurement. I call Colette Stevenson to be followed by Douglas Ross. Thank you, President Officer. I very much welcome the content of today's statement and thank the Minister for advance sight of it. Can the Minister outline how the Scottish Government is working with stakeholders, including local authorities, ADPs and the third sector, to improve local governance in services? And can she also confirm how best practice from across the country will be used to drive improvements in the service? Minister. Uh, President officer, as I uh, intimated in my statement, we have agreed um, eight recommendations with COSLA, um, and essentially that is about improving the work of alcohol and drug partnerships, uh, but also include health boards, local authorities, police and third sector uh, partners, both in terms of the need for all of those partners uh, to work together, but also to ensure that health boards are taking on their responsibilities uh, to uh, appro give appropriate support to integration authorities uh, and subsequently uh, to alcohol and drug partnerships uh, too. Um, as I also mentioned, that we are currently testing um, some self-assessment tools. And again, that's all about governance, strategic planning, uh, quality improvement, financial planning, as well as accountability. And uh, that should be rolled out next month. 
Um, but it is important to say that as well as uh, peer review and um, the new liaison structures between my officials and ADPs, that there is also scope uh, for external uh, validation to ensure that the, the right actions are taken to improve local uh, governance and also Public Health Scotland uh, are doing a range of work um, in this area as well. And we are mapping the contributions um, of partners to this work and that includes investments also. I call Douglas Ross to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. On Monday, I will publish the final proposals for the Right to Recovery Bill, which I am taking through this Parliament. The Minister will be aware that 77 per cent of the respondents to the consultation on that bill were in support. Can the Minister tell us if the Scottish Government will give its support to this bill, which has been drafted by frontline experts and those with lived experience who know what is needed to tackle Scotland's drug deaths? Minister. Sign officer, as I have um, said to Mr Ross on a number of occasions now that his bill, when he brings it forward and when we can uh, see the detail of it, uh, will absolutely be given a fair and sympathetic hearing. Um, I know there are uh, a range of views expressed on, on the bill. Um, I'm not going to jump in and either give a blank cheque. Um, you know, a, a rosy endorsement or indeed an unfair criticism uh, to something that I have not seen. But I do look forward uh, to seeing the detail. I have met Mr Ross in the past to discuss this and to um, candidly discuss you know, some of um, the issues that I would hope to see reflected in the Bill if he, if he uh, brings it forward. It will be given a fair and sympathetic hearing by this Government. I call Bob Doris to be followed by Paul Sweeney. Uh, Officer, the Minister mentioned health and social care partnerships. I anticipate Glasgow's partnership would have a key role should NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde be able to finally proceed with its safe consumption facility planned in 2016. And I pay tribute to Paul Sweeney for his recent consultation that he has lodged an associated matter. Presiding officer. Was the Minister able to raise resolving the legal uncertainty over safe consumption facilities when she attended the UK Government's National Drug Summit last week? And what other matters were discussed? Minister. Sign officer, um, I did indeed intend the UK Government Drug Summit last week. Um, I was invited and I think I was the uh, only representative there from a, a devolved nation. Um, I am of the view that it is important to engage and uh, discuss matters even with those people that you have you know, quite fundamental disagreements about. Um, issues that I raised directly with the UK Government are issues that I have raised in the past. Uh, in terms of the Misuse of Drugs Act, I would like to see that uh, reformed. If the UK will not reform it, I would wish them to um, devolve it. So, uh, we did indeed uh, once again discuss uh, matters such as uh, safe drug consumption. Members will be aware that, uh, as a government, we are also pursuing um, our own activities and actions uh, in terms of what we can do within our own legal powers. But we also discussed uh, uh, issues in and around regulation for pill press regulation. I recently met with the National Crime Association and it's a National Crime Agency, sorry, and it's an area that I'm pushing the UK government um, to make progress on. I think they're willing. I'm just keen for them to go a wee bit faster. Thank you. I call Paul Sweeney to be followed by Julian Martin. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I thank the Minister for her statement, but it has left me rather underwhelmed. The Minister has said repeatedly that establishing overdose prevention centres in Scotland is a priority and an essential tool to tackling the drug death crisis in our midst. Yet today's set piece statement on drug deaths, there isn't a single mention of the government's work so far on delivering these overdose prevention centres in Scotland. And she will know that yesterday I launched my members' bill consultation that seeks to establish these OPCs in Scotland. But I must ask, why has it been left to opposition members to drive the pace of these reforms when we both agree on the need of it? And when are we likely to see genuine, tangible updates and progress from the government on delivering overdose prevention sites under its own competence? Minister. Officer, can I say to Mr Sweeney that I have made a commitment to this Parliament uh, about improving accountability and governance. And while um, issues in and around government, governance may not excite everyone, but they are crucially important. This is a shared agenda. We all have our individual uh, responsibilities. We all have our part to play. And I actually consider it crucial a crucial part of the national mission that we hold ourselves and each other to account both locally and nationally. Um, in terms of safer consumption rooms, 
Uh, Mr Sweeney is right. Uh, there is very strong support for those uh, right across uh, this Parliament. The evidence, in my view, as is his, is clear and compelling. And the only debate now is how, how they are actually delivered. And I am sure Mr Sweeney is aware that the Scottish Government is leaving no stone unturned right now to deliver clinically and legally safe uh, consumption facilities within our powers. Um, and I will continue to pursue that activity within our own powers, because at the end of the day, I don't want to be asking the UK Government for permission, because it's quite clear to me that they are not going to uh, reform the Misuse of Drugs Act. It is quite clear to me that, uh, and certainly short to medium term, we are not going to come to an agreement with the UK Government uh, over uh, safe consumption facilities. I think that's a matter of regret when even Mr Ross um, is of the view that the Conservatives shouldn't stand in the way of a pilot. So the consensus is, stro is strong in Scotland, but we are engaged with our partners. Um, we will leave no stone unturned uh, within our own powers, and that's the route I'm following. I appreciate that Mr Sweeney has an alternative proposal, and as with other legislative proposals, they will always be given um, a fair and sympathetic hearing. Uh, thank you. Before I, before I call the, uh, the next uh, uh, member, I, I, I would just point out I have six more members that I would hope to call, and perhaps time is, is not as it was ten minutes ago. And therefore, I would make a plea for succinct questions and Minister uh, succinct answers. I do appreciate there's a lot of ground to cover, but we can see if we can fit everybody in. I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to ask the Minister about drug testing schemes where substances can be tested for rogue ingredients that could lead to extreme harm or even death. It's my understanding that licences to facilitate this can be given by the UK Government. Indeed, one was given to the Loop scheme in Bristol uh, in conjunction with the City Council there. Um, what is the Minister's position on this? Minister. Sign off, sir. As I have stated to Parliament before, I am fully supportive of the work being done to implement drug checking facilities in Scotland. Um, the task force um, funded some initial research projects uh, by Stirling University around the development of drug checking programme, and I am pleased that the first application for the three prospective sites will be submitted uh, to the Home Office in the next month. It is very encouraging to see the project in Bristol receive a licence, uh, and I would very much hope that the Home Office will likewise see the benefits of these facilities being introduced in Scotland. And I made that very point to Mr Malthouse when I met him last week. I call Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, dear Deputy Presiding Officer. The Minister knows that Liberal Democrats want her to succeed in this regard, and she has our good wishes to that end. Um, it is encouraging in the statement to see the direction of travel towards rehab, but these services need to be sustainable even when occupancy drifts below 50%. Uh, but before people can access rehab, they need to be stabilised uh, first and foremost. And the Minister and I have many times discussed the need to address the gap in stabilisation services. That did not feature in today's statement. I wonder if she could now update the Chamber as to where we are on stabilisation. Minister. Sign off, sir. Um, Mr Cohamilton will appreciate that the statement was about governance and accountability and some of the nuts and bolts um, in and around that. Um, but like him, I am a supporter of stabilisation services. They are not necessarily easy to run. They are, are also expensive. And they are separate to residential rehabilitation uh, and those absence-based programmes, but there does need to be links between uh, the relevant services. And of course, some of the work we are doing around commissioning, uh, regional and national commissioning um, in the residential rehabilitation sector is quite germane to this, um, in that the, the, the work that we are doing through Scotland Excel will help establish that the level of need at different uh, geographies across, across the country, but it is an area um, that we are very focused on. I call Stuart McMillan, who is joining us remotely, to be followed by Sanjay Kilhani. Ms McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. First, I would like to remind the Chamber that I am a board member of Moving On and Reply to Local Addiction Service. I would be grateful if the Minister can provide an update as to how she will ensure that the views of recovering users, families and also associated charities continue to be taken on board. Minister. 
Yes, absolutely. And, you know, governance and accountability isn't just about uh, data, important though that is, or policies and procedures. Uh, all of these um, activities need to be informed uh, centrally uh, and consistently by the views of people with lived and living experience. Uh, and actually, much of the work that we have done around accountability um, has actually been in response to what we have heard um, from people with drug and alcohol problems, their families, and indeed those organisations and advocates uh, who are, who are uh, representing them. So we are you know, continuing to, uh, you know, for example, report on a quarterly basis around our investments in residential rehab, um, we will committed to six monthly reporting on MAT standards. Um, we are increasing financial security. There is, of course, the, the, the treatment target, and there is the work that we are doing to improve governance, um, both in terms of accountability at a national uh, and a local level. I call Sanders Gohani to be followed by Julian Mackay. Drug deaths is our national shame. Uh, I welcome the minister talking about data and accountability with each drug death now being investigated. But I am upset that this information is not already available as it is so vital. I would like to ask the Minister, once the investigation into a drug death has been concluded, what is the mechanism that will allow the lessons learnt to be translated into action to save lives in the future? Minister. President officer, I, um, there's, there's part of this area that I feel very strongly about and, and always struggle with because when we talk about uh, learning the lessons, it trips off the tongue uh, very easily but can sound really, really trite. And I know from my background um, as a professional social worker but also uh, in other portfolios in this government that there is guidance out there that sets the very clear parameters when the, the death of a child should be investigated uh, or indeed a vulnerable adult and there is guidance around the, the process in which that should be done and how the information should, should, be, um, should be shared etc. And I think as a minimum we should have the same for the reporting of uh, reviews into drug related deaths. So it is something that we will be doing some further work and consultation on. I am keen that we get this absolutely right. I am also um, very conscious that these reviews can be really important for families who are seeking answers. So this is an area I feel very strongly about. It is an area that as politicians we can sound a bit trite on, um, but it is an area that I want to ensure that we can make a difference on. Julian Mackay to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Minister for advance sight of her statement, and I welcome her commitment to improving consistency of drug death reviews. As she said, it will improve data collection, allow national trends to be established, and most importantly, it will give families answers and ensure that they have certainty in the process. Will the Minister commit to taking any necessary action to ensure that there is consistency across Scotland in how drug death reviews are being carried out and ensure that these are carried out in as many cases as possible? Minister. Um, yes, and following on from my um, answer to Sandish uh, Galhani, um, Ms Mackay makes an important point about consistency um, because while most areas uh, currently do do uh, reviews of drug deaths, they are all done in uh, a, a different fashion um, and there is not always that visibility um, of the review process or indeed the outcomes either at a local or national level. Um, but I again have an open mind, I think as a minimum, um, the, uh, the, the, procedures, the new procedures that we put in place should reflect at least what is in place for child deaths or under vulnerable adult uh, procedures. But I do have an open mind and if she has further suggestions about how we can strengthen our resolve and approach in this area, uh, she would be very welcome to share them. And I call Ruth McGuire. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the Minister's statement and the clarity around um, accountability. Can I ask um, how, as part of that important accountability, we can ensure that services are flexible enough to meet people where they are and enable them to participate fully in the decision-making which affects them? Minister. Sign officer, as I intimated earlier, I mean, integration authorities have very clear legal responsibilities um, in this area to uh, plan and provide um, services. But it is clear that they can't do this alone. 
Um, we also need greater um, clarity and support uh, around the role and function of alcohol and drug partnerships. Um, and that whole range of, of, of partners um, need to be involved, whether that's you know, voluntary organisations, and we need to see more in terms of meaningful partnership with voluntary organisations um, at that uh, very local level. And of course, the, the MAT standards uh, is another vehicle in which uh, par improved partnership working um, will be driven. And I think the other aspect of MAT standards, which uh, Ms Maguire I know will be interested in, is that how it helps us make systemic changes uh, to prevent people being bounced around from addiction, homeless uh, and mental health services. And this is work that we are embarked upon uh, right now um, as we are investing in reforming services uh, like never before in terms of drug and alcohol services. Uh, but our longer term vision is a, isn't around the National Care Service, uh, which will provide that single structure uh, for accountability. Um, and with the further integration of community health and social care, we will be able to provide better joined up and person centred services. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the statement, and we will move on to the next item of business, prior to which there will be a very short pause to allow frontbench teams to change positions, should they wish. Thank you.